Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Andrew Seeley, Executive Vice President of the Wilson Center, here to welcome you on behalf of Jane Harmon, our President and CEO, who's out of town today. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting uh, the Iran Forum today for a very timely, important, high-level discussion um, of one of the most important topics of the day, clearly, the, the agreement with Iran. Um, this is the fifth in a series that the Wilson Center has co-hosted with the, the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Rand Corporation, the Arms Control Association, the Plowshares Fund, the Center for New American Security, the Stimson Center, and the Partnership for Secure America, all faithful partners on a number of initiatives, but has been a, a coalition that has worked uh, very closely together on providing information analysis uh, throughout the as the negotiations were going on and, and now that they've been concluded. Um, this event is also brought to you by the Iran Primer, a comprehensive website co-sponsored by, by USIP and the Wilson Center. Please visit iranprimer.com for analysis and resources on every Iran-related subject you can imagine. Um, special thanks to Robin Wright, who is a distinguished uh, fellow here at the Wilson Center and at USIP. She is a joint fellow at, at both institutions um, and is also the creator of the Iran Primer, and uh, she has brought the program here today. And thank you to Robin for all the great pieces she's written on this um, in The New Yorker, and elsewhere. Um, she's been all over the news. You've probably seen her in the past few days. Um, but she has also written some of the most insightful pieces um, from within Iran, um, as well as from, from this side of, of uh, the ocean. Um, our panel is going to analyze the nuclear deal and explain who got what from the agreement and explore what is next for all parties. I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, Doyle McManus. Doyle, I think, is known to everyone here. He is the Washington columnist for the Los Angeles Times. He's reported from the Middle East, Europe, Latin America, and Washington, D.C. for 35 years, covering wars, revolutions, and presidential campaigns and negotiations. Um, we're pleased you were able to lead this conversation today, Doyle, and thank you. He's a good friend of the Wilson Center. Um, before I pass over to Doyle, I'd like to remind everybody that the Wilson Center will host a program next Wednesday, the 29th, at 9 a.m. on the Iran nuclear deal, which will feature perspectives from the region, from allies, partners, and, and various countries within the region on how they see the deal. It should be a very interesting discussion. And now let me turn it over to Doyle McManus to, to lead this discussion today. Thank you, Doyle. And actually, Doyle, before I turn it over to you, let me uh, also acknowledge Henri Barkey, who is the new director of the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. Great to have you here. And, and Rob Litvak, who is our vice president for scholars, but also has written extensively on, on the deal as well. So, Doyle, thanks. Andrew, thank you. Uh, and thanks to you and Jane and Henri and the Wilson Center for hosting uh, yet another timely uh, session of, of important public education on an extraordinarily important set of issues with a remarkable all-star panel. Uh, the full biographies of uh, the panel are on pieces of paper that you should have received on the table outside, but, but very briefly, uh, they are from, from your right, uh, my left, uh, Joe Cirincioni, who has been working on nuclear disarmament for more than 25 years. He's the president of, of Plowshares Fund, which is a global security foundation, uh, the author of Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late, and uh, uh, in good stead for this discussion, a former uh, uh, staff member on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Dr. Oli Hanonen, uh, known to anyone who has been following nuclear disarmament for years, uh, is the eminence grise of verification. He was at the IAEA for 27 years and is now a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center. Um, Elizabeth Rosenberg uh, is an eminence, eminence but not yet grise. Uh, she was a senior advisor on terrorism and financial uh, intelligence at the Treasury Department which means she had enormous responsibility for designing and, uh, and imposing sanctions, uh, including on Iran, and she's now a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. And Robin Wright, known to all friends of the Wilson Center and to anyone who has followed uh, Iranian affairs for the last uh, 40 years. She's now a joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Wilson Center. Uh, she is a, a former journalist. Uh, I had the great joy and pleasure of being her colleague and co-writer on a number of projects. Uh, Robin, of course, has visited Iran regularly since 1973, and her latest, uh, uh, her report on her last visit is in the current issue of The New Yorker. Uh, what I would like to do is, is really uh, open a conversation on uh, our topic today, which is what are the promises of this agreement with Iran, and what are the pitfalls? If all goes well, what uh, kind of world might we be looking at, but what might not go well? It's rare that everything goes well 
in, in international affairs. And uh, of course, uh, some of the things that could go badly are in Washington and others are in Tehran. Um, I'd like to start with Joe Cirincioni. Joe, of course, the center of the issue here is proliferation. That's what this is about. Uh, not merely proliferation in Iran, but proliferation in the entire Middle East. So uh, from, from your vantage point, uh, what is the, the promise of this deal? What mm -hmm. could this bring us? And uh, what are the potential pitfalls? This is a diplomatic triumph. This deal is a major national security victory. It's, it's hard to see it any other way. I can't think of a national security agreement or a nuclear nonproliferation agreement that is more important than this one in the last 20 years. You have to go back to the efforts that led to the denuclearization of Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan at the end of the Cold War to see something this sweeping, this dramatic, both because it stops Iran from getting a bomb, it stops a, another usually destructive war in the Middle East, but it shores up a nonproliferation system that was teetering. If we did not get this deal, if Iran had gone ahead to get the bomb, there would have been tremendous pressure for other countries in the region to, to duplicate those efforts. There would have been a l complete loss of confidence in the internet locking system of treaties and agreements that the United States has been building up since the time of President Kennedy. So the, the risks here were uh, enormous. The consequences global and the gains tr tremendous. The United States went into this negotiation with three goals. One, stop all Iran's pathways to the bomb. Block them every way they could possibly build a bomb. Two, put a verification system in place so that if they tried to creep out or sneak out or break out, we would catch them. And three, keep together the international coalition that had put the sanctions in place so that if we catch them, there could be consequences. The, snacks, the sanctions could snap back into place. There'd be punishment and there, thereby be a deterrent for Iran even, even trying to cheat. I think this agreement achieved all those objectives. It shrink wraps the Iranian nuclear program. It cuts it down to a fraction of what it currently is. They have to rip out two-thirds of their centrifuges and the plumbing underground that's connecting them. It'd be no easy job putting them back in 15 years from now, 10 years from now. They have to destroy over 98% of the uranium gas. Remember that cartoon bomb that Bibi Netanyahu held up and warned that Iran was weeks away? That gas, that gas is gone under this deal. That bomb disappears, erased. They have to rip out the core of their plutonium production reactor, drill it full of holes and fill it with concrete. Who does this? What agreement requires people to physically destroy their capabilities to such a, an extent? And then it wraps that shrunken program in an unprecedented verification system, much tougher than anything Ali ever have had at his disposal. Are there some concerns? Are there some issues? Yes. But overall, this is a solid inspection regime, much better than anything we have ever negotiated. The only thing that compares to this is when you've occupied a country and really get to go anywhere, anytime, because there's nobody to oppose you. So why isn't this being treated as a diplomatic triumph? How come John Kerry's not going to get a ticker tape parade when he shows up at the Hill today? In the policy world, there is not a big dispute about this. Nuclear policy experts, national security experts overwhelmingly endorse this agreement endorse this approach. You could line up 10 nuclear nonproliferation experts, nine of them would endorse this agreement. This is now a political fight. This is a political battle. We have to be honest here. There's a Republican-controlled Congress that doesn't want to give a Democratic president a, a victory. If President Obama presented a cure for cancer, they would reject it. And so Kerry and Moniz and the best Nuclear experts in the U.S. government, people who spent 20 months of their lives negotiating this, are going to go up and they're not going to be patted on the back. They're going to be crucified at the hearings today. I'm, I, 
in addition to nuclear politics, I read sports pages a lot. And I just keep thinking this is like a ball game. Where Kerry's the captain of a team and he just won the game 10 to 2. They got 14 hits, they got two errors. And all the sports writers want to talk about is those two errors. Why did the shortstop bobble the ball? How come the third baseman bounced the ball on the way to first? What does this mean for the long-term viability of the team? What happens to the next game they play? And Kerry's saying, what are you talking about? We won. This is a huge victory. No, 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 no. We want to talk about the errors. We want to examine those errors in mean minute quality. And then, while you're having this argument on the field, a foreign leader steps out of the crowd. Some guy who wasn't born here, never played ball, never won a game, declares himself the umpire and says, you lost. You lost the game. And this Israeli umpire now comes in and declares the game is over. And suddenly, 54 other people come out of the stands, say that they're the Washington Senators, and they think you lost too. And you know what? You've got to replay the game. You've got to replay the game. But the other team's gone. The lights are off. The fans have left the stadium. The tarp is over the field. There is no replaying the game. But this is the crazy debate we're having. If this scenario sounds absurd, welcome to Washington. Because <laughs> that is the debate we're having. I'm telling you, if President Obama was a Republican, they would have already renamed the airport after him. <laughs> this deal is that good, that sweeping, that profound. Are there issues that we want to talk about? Absolutely. We're going to talk about inspections? Let's talk about inspections. And what happens here? And whether it's 24-7 or not, whether it's anytime, anywhere or not. But make no mistake about it, under this inspection regime, if Iran tries to cheat, we are going to catch them. It is almost impossible for Iran to evade the multi-level inspection regime that's here. We, for the next 25 years, we're going to be tracking Iran's uranium program from the time the uranium ore leaves the mine until it ends up as a gas cylinder. We're going to be tracking the production of every single centrifuge rotor. We're going to be tracking the scientists. We're going to be tracking the engineers. A special procurement channel has been set up, so everything they have to buy has to go through this procurement channel. Can they build a secret room someplace? Maybe. But where are they going to get the uranium to put in it? Where are they going to get the machines? Where are they going to get the scientists? That's the beauty of this deal. And finally, and this is where I'll close, like all good negotiations, this is a deal that allows everybody to leave the table and declare victory whether you're players and owners, labor or management, banker and mortgage, e, you've got to be able to feel good about the deal. So Iran says their rights have been respected. They've been treated with respect, and that's true. They, they have, don't have to dismantle a single building in their nuclear complex, and that's true. They keep the buildings. We get all the furniture. It's a brilliantly negoti negotiated diplomatic deal that's going to keep the United States safe for a long time. This is why the Saudis have endorsed this deal. Read the paper today. This is why the Saudi monarchy, the bitter rivals, re regional and religious rivals of these Persian Shia state have endorsed this deal, even as they're fighting Iranian-backed forces in Yemen. Because they understand that on a whole, this makes their situation better this makes the region a little more secure, and it opens up possibilities that before this deal simply didn't exist. Joe, let me push you, push you on one point uh, further on, on proliferation. There is, as you know, a school of criticism that says this deal looks good for 10 years. It looks good for 13, 14, 15 years. But after that, Iran can resume enriching. After that, Iran can return to mm. uh, a centrifuge program. After that, Iran becomes in effect, a threshold nuclear state. Yeah. Is that, is that correct, and is that a problem? I think there's a concern there. I wouldn't use those words to describe it. When we first discovered Iran's program, when they had 164 centrifuges during the Bush administration, I and many nonproliferation experts said they have to go. Everything has to go. There's zero option, no enrichment, no centrifuges. The French said, you can't be a little bit pregnant. They could, we could have gotten that deal, but the Bush administration wasn't interested in negotiation. As, Vic, as Vice President Cheney famously said, we don't negotiate with evil, we defeat it. So they had their shot at defeating evil. The program went from 164 centrifuges to 6,000. It grew, and during the time we put on sanctions, it grew more. 
So the previous approaches have not worked to stop the program. This is the first approach that, has, that stops the program, rolls it back, and verifies its shrinkage. I think there's too many centrifuges. I would have preferred zero. I would have preferred that we could raise all the buildings and salt the earth, but we are not Rome and Iran is not Carthage. This is a compromise agreement. So it leaves them with, with a vestigial function here. In 10 years, they'll be allowed to start putting more centrifuges in. But the supply of gas that goes into centrifuges still remains at only 300 kilograms. You know what you can do with 300 kilograms of LEU gas? Squat. Nothing. It's token. In 15 years, they're allowed to increase that. But still, the other restrictions remain. The procurement channel, the major intrusive inspections regime. It's only after 25 years that some of those get to go. But even then, the core parts of this agreement, the inspection regime, and the ban on ever building nuclear weapons, ever doing research on any nuclear weapons component, those are like diamonds. They last forever. So your bottom line is that after year 15, Iran is still a concern, but it's a lesser concern because of, of the safeguards that are there. It's a concern, it's a concern that we, in national security, very often your victories are buying time. And you just bought 25 years here. And at the end of that 25 years, all our options are still available. We are no worse off than we are now, in some ways a lot better, because I'll tell you what we're left with. After 25 years of inspecting that program, we have an exquisite target set. We are going to know everything there is to know about the Iranian program. And if you decide that at 25 years you need to exercise the military option, that is going to be a far more efficient military option than it is right now. Uh, Oli, for, for Joe's benign scenario to work, all of the verification has to work. Military options? That's not so benign. Uh, uh, for, for your benign option to work. And, uh, of course, administration officials have described this verification regime as, as unprecedented and extraordinary in its sweep. So I'd li like to ask you first to evaluate that claim and then second uh, to talk about what parts of the verification regime in your view will be easy to carry out and which parts would worry you, which ones will be difficult to carry out. Thank you, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to explain this. I will keep my remarks in a very technical, very dry, not <laughs> painting any rosy pictures about the future. But when I look as an engineer or scientist this program and the deal, Iran has not changed its nuclear course. It's going to maintain in years to come a uranium enrichment program which exceeds its economical and technical needs. We can put there milestones, like now there will be dismantling of a certain number of centrifuges and this will be done as uh, Joe said in a very thorough way. So I think that's good. But the capacity which stays there is enough to produce, as Secretary Kerry has said several times, enough uh, 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 weapons grade uranium in one year time if Iran so decides. So this will be with those five to 6,000 centrifuges which stay in, in uh, Natanz and in Fordow. But then the picture changes. Year 10, Iran is allowed to put up additional centrifuges with no number in li limit limitations in the numbers. There's a certain gradual increase. But now the picture changes. Actually, this 300 kilograms which uh, Joe said becomes irrelevant because this uh, uh, centrifuges are much more powerful than the previous one, so you can use the natural uranium as a feed. And as President Obama said, and his number is correct, the breakout time drops to a few weeks during next five years. Then after year 15, Iran can have any number of centrifuges, any number, uh, any amount of uh, enriched uranium stocks uh, to any enrichment. So then the breakout time actually comes uh, practically two weeks, a couple of weeks. So this I think we see, need to see technically. Then if you take then the reinforcement before I go to the verification itself, when you come to year 15, if the breakout time is let's say two or three weeks, what is the effect time for snapback access, uh, sanctions? I think it will be months if not years. So then the sanction regime starts to become obsolete. You need to have some other, other ways and means to stop if you uh, want to do it or, or if there is a need. So we need to keep this in mind. 
The second option, apart from technical and uh, economical observations, is that Iran actually has agreed to implement additional protocol. That's fine, provisionally. And this is something which a little bit disturbs me because they implement it provision provisionally until the IAEA reaches the conclusion that Iran's nuclear program is for peaceful use is only. And once IAEA has done this conclusion, then Iran will seek to ratify the Addison Protocol. This goes against all the principles and practices of the IAEA. IAEA has not done any conclusion about peaceful nuclear program without country first ratifying the protocol. So I think that this will be a problem in this system, this voluntary undertaking on this and some other voluntary undertakings which are there. And we have a track history for that. So we need to be uh, careful when we judge these things. Then we come to the verification. I think that the IAEA verification system for existing facilities is robust. IAEA will detect in a very short period of time, timely, any substantial diversion of declared nuclear material from, uh, for example, from Natanz or Fordo or conversion facilities is, is in Isfahan. And now they get some additional tools that they can work more efficiently. Assurances don't increase, they are already there. But this releases manpower from the IAEA to look the other things like undeclared activities. So this is the benefit of this 24-7 access in the beginning. Maybe there year 15, it may have some other benefits to the system. Then Iran, like uh, many other proliferate, proliferator cases in uh, last two decades, they took the advantage of uh, using undeclared nuclear material at undeclared facilities. And that's why we have the additional protocol at fine. We have certain voluntary uh, transparency undertakings from Iran, which IAEA will verify. I would have preferred to have actually quite a lot of more there, because this was the weak part of the, of the IAEA verification system or any international verification system. I had a testimony yesterday in the uh, House uh, Financial Services Committee, so you can read much of those details there, but I just take a couple of, couple of them here because of the time present. The first one is that um, this kind of verification should start it from the clean table. So Iran should have given, given to the international community full complete story of its current and past nuclear program as a starting point like it did in 2003 as a part of the agreement between EU3. And why I say it, because we have this period from 2005 to, to today when there were a lot of uh, nuclear activities in Iran which the international community doesn't know, IAEA doesn't know. So we don't start from the clean basis. The second thing is this uh, access which has taken a lot of publicity, the delay handling, if Iran delays the IAEA access, for example, to suspected sites or some other places, this 24-day period. Well, in a certain way, it is good that there is a time, uh, time limit, but it opens an other set of possibilities for those who want to delay and deceive. And in, I'm now here more concerned when you come to this period of 10 and 15 years where entirely different uh, things need to be verified, like uh, production of uh, uh, metal uranium R&D in plutonium or uranium metallurgy. And I have given an example that, you know, which I think is a solid to this end. AQK network had a very nice small plan how to produce uh, nuclear weapons components, uranium weapons components in a small scale for the Rook state. Uh, he had there 100 kilograms of high ended uranium rolled in in a uranium hexafluoride. This is just a few cylinders, small cylinders. In one year time, or actually less in this case, in three months time all this material is turned to uranium metal components of uh, four nuclear devices. How much does this need space? 
This is not a big factor. I would say three times this room will be sufficient as a footprint. And here comes the point. Let's assume that someone finds it or gets a whiff that it is there and asks to have an access to such a place. Three uh, weeks is too long time. One can remove this equipment. This is not a heavy equipment. This is not where you need huge amount of trucks rolling in. This equipment is gone in one night from that place. Then you have three weeks time to renovate the place put new floors, new walls, new ceilings, remove the ventilation, spray with concrete, and it looks entirely different building. And this is the, what we saw sometime in 2003 in Iran. But here is the difference. If someone does this today, it's part of the plan. It's not an ad hoc arrangement like it was perhaps in 2003. This would be part of the plan of execution. So these are the deficiencies which I think that this agreement has. Then there are certain parts which I also want to pr bring to the people's attention are entirely unverifiable. There's no way that you can verify. And I actually, I saw that Secretary Moniz actually ac uh, acknowledged it yesterday. And these are mainly to, to do things related to nuclear weapon development design. There are software, uh, special models, how you design uh, uh, implosion weapon. Uh, multiple detonator, uh, manufacturing acquisition and testing. You really can't m verify with any technical means those. Those are all based on intelligence. If you are lucky, you get it. If not, you, you don't have it. So uh, with this positive note, you know, I would like to uh, <laughs> end up my remarks. So Oli, let me, let me attempt to summarize ruthlessly, boil down your conclusion that you have high confidence that, that effective verification is possible in the first 10 years. Your confidence begins to diminish in the 10 to 15 year range. And then after that, you have some quite serious concerns, especially on what you called undeclared activities and what others might call covert activities. Is that a, a fair summary? No, no, not for 10 years I exactly that way. Also, the uh, covert activities are valid for the first 10 years. Yeah. And I give you to that end example, time didn't uh, uh, let me to do it. One of the good provisions there is uh, that the IAEA can verify the production of uh, centrifuge rotors and certain other components at declared manufacturing facilities. IAEA sees how many Iran tells how many rotors are there, IAEA goes and counts, and then follows them. But this doesn't tell how many rotors Iran has. First of all, it doesn't tell how many it had manufactured before this took place. The second thing is that uh, I mentioned that the Iranian uh, manufacturing program has also changed over the last uh, 10 years. 10 years ago, they manufactured many of these components in military installations in Iran. Now they have moved them to the private companies, and uh, they manufacture them there, companies owned by, by atomic energy organization. But the capabilities and the instruments remain to a certain degree also there in the military installations. So you are watching here these declared places without knowing how many uh, rotors they ever uh, uh, manufactured, but there are other places who can do the same things. Can IAEA detect these other places even if it gets there? I think that the chances are almost zero to find out that there has been clandestine production of rotors in some flow forming machine in half the year, which is at the same time doing rockets. So there are pitfalls from the very beginning also, but we have to keep in mind that the needs change with the time. And certainly what we look in the beginning is very different what we, where ne we need to focus in year 15 and 10. Thanks. Uh, Liz, you helped uh, design, build, and force sanctions. I think there's a lot of confusion out there on which sanctions come off early, which sanctions may come off later, which sanctions may not come off at all. So I hope you could start just by clearing away the clouds of confusion that, that many of us are under and, and, and kind of sketching the timetable for the next few years. Sure, I'd be happy to help with that. Um, although, uh, spoiler alert, these are pretty Byzantine, they're very complicated, and um, even people like me who spend lots of time thinking about all of these details still have lots of questions about uh, exactly how this will go, and that's in part because there's still a number of unknowns out there that we'll uh, learn more about as the deal moves forward, specifically around 
implementation day, which is where I'll start <laughs> by explaining this. Um, mm. In the agreement, uh, <coughs> implementation days, uh, there are a number of important uh, milestones. Implementation day is a really important one for sanctions. And that is the, uh, if you will, the day when this all really goes live. Um, that is when uh, the uh, Iran gets um, uh, an, a report card that says it's uh, completed a number of very significant nuclear uh, commitments, concessions on its part. It's hit those benchmarks, and the international community, the P5 plus one, um, will move forward with its uh, a major amount of s economically significant sanctions relief. And so we've heard from um, U.S. government officials and others that that implementation day milestone could come in about six months' time or six to nine months' time, and that depends on how fast Iran moves to hit those uh, benchmarks and make those nuclear concessions. So what happens at that point? Um, what we'll see then is the lifting of a, a very significant majority of uh, EU sanctions on Iran. Um, and uh, not all, but quite a lot. Uh, this is all of the um, energy, financial services, uh, shipping, insurance, um, uh, autos, et cetera, those kind of sanctions that we've heard about a lot in the news. They include in the financial services sector the restrictions on correspondent banking relationships, which means can Iran get its banks wired back into the EU financial system and process payments, which is, of course, essential um, to doing trade and commerce between uh, European companies and Iran, so its connectivity to the outside world. And also the SWIFT sanctions, you may have heard about these. These are the sanctions imposed on uh, the company. It happens to be headquartered in the EU. Um, which is why it's subject to these, uh, well, it's subject to these sanctions. Uh, um, it, this is the company that hosts international financial payment messages, which basically means um, all the wires, all the money transfers that, you, that are made globally, almost all of them, uh, get cleared through this, uh, through this particular company. It hosts the payment messaging system. So this is really the major lock that if you unlock it, it will allow Iran to come back into the global financial system. It's very significant. Uh, you could even say more significant than quite a number of the U.S. sanctions uh, that are imposed on Iran. So on implementation day, those are the EU ones. And for the U.S. part, um, there will be a lifting of a number of the sanctions that apply to non-U.S. companies. Again, in a number of these energy, economic areas, uh, financial services, um, autos, et cetera, et cetera. They won't include many, uh, a reprieve for U.S. companies for the most part. So we're talking about the ability for non-U.S. companies to go back into Iran with the embargo um, or a set of regulations that restrict U.S. companies or U.S. people from engaging in business with Iran. They mostly stay in place. There are a couple of exceptions there for uh, commercial aircraft, pistachios, rugs, <laughs> that sort of thing, um, and other ones too, uh, personal communications devices and, and that sort of thing, but uh, it's pretty limited and there's, of course, lots of conditions that exist on the narrow amount of trade that U.S. companies can do and, in fact, uh, the, the kind of commerce that foreign companies can do with Iran, which is one of the reasons why <coughs> on implementation day, while it seems like quite a lot of sanctions relief, um, all of these major areas, and it's certainly the makings of a major economic uh, reform and expansion for Iran, but it's not going to happen fast, and it's not going to uh, be overwhelming in the early uh, months and possibly years, and that's because there are a lot of attendant risks around this. There's a concern about the deal collapsing, so Joe spoke um, about some of the spoilers, Congress in particular. Um, which may, which in many people's mind, threaten the stability or the longevity of the deal. Um, if Congress can undermine it, there are others too, of course. Um, there's concern about Iran as a safe place to do business. It does not have a stellar record on financial sector transparency, on corruption, on um, money laundering, et cetera, as documented publicly by their own law enforcement system. So that's a concern for any international financial company that would like to go and do business. Uh, and there are also the concerns, and it will take a, a certain amount of time to rewire, if you or to uh, reconnect, if you will, the plumbing of the international financial system. I was talking about the SWIFT s sanctions, but uh, 
for all of those companies and banks in the EU and elsewhere which have had a lot of Iranian entities on a list, they won't do business with them, they, you know, there's a, an alert that goes off in their computer systems when someone tries to open an account or wire money, I, I highly doubt that, the, that any of those companies will immediately say, okay, no problem, we're no longer concerned, you know, here we go, guns blazing. They're concerned about getting wrapped up in sanctions um, violations, which are very expensive. They can be in into the billions, um, and also uh, effort violations, and also the reputational harm, which arguably is more significant to them and can trail with them for quite a long time, particularly for publicly held companies, the multinationals, that's a very big concern. Can I explain that a, a little bit more clearly? When you say that, for example, a, 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 a bank, a financial firm, might hesitate to reopen its swift transactions with, with Iran because of fear that it would violate sanctions. Well, what sanctions after implementation day might it be violating? Ah, yes, right. So we've talked about these, all these sanctions that come off, and there's quite a lot that still remain in place. The U.S. embargo, of course, so that restricts U.S. companies. There are a host of sanctions, not just in the, U, in the U.S., but also in the EU and elsewhere that relate to concerns about terrorism in Iran, uh, Iran's support for terrorism, human rights, uh, uh, support for destabilizing activities in Syria and elsewhere in the region that remain in place. And that will mean, and these are apply to certain entities, so uh, in the agreement you'll, you'll see itself in the annexes there are long lists of entities that come off the list, some um, early on in the process and some much later in the process, uh, towards the eight-year time horizon, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of entities on the U.S. list, still hundreds of them, that uh, will remain on there, which are no-goes, and some of them uh, still have a secondary effect, which means that even if foreign companies, an EU company or uh, an Asian company, plans to do business with one of these entities that has been designated by the U.S. for uh, involvement in Iran's support for terrorism, it still faces penalties in the U.S. financial system. So no responsible international company is going to want to wade into that and risk sanctions violation, pen financial penalties, or reputational risk. So as a practical matter, let's say a, a, a European bank will be able to do some business with Iran after implementation day, but A, not instantly, and B, it will have to be very, very careful. Absolutely. And so here's the rub, is because you can see how a number of companies would, uh, would want to get involved and they're interested in the kind of commerce they can do, trading, investment, and they may be comfortable with uh, a high degree of risk. They might operate in um, a number of very unstable states. You can think of some of the people who have chosen to invest in, um, in Sudan, in Iraq, and they, they feel comfortable managing that. However, their banks only take a small percentage of the money that is wired, or uh, they're only supporting the commerce. So for them, the calculation uh, is much different, and they're often in the position of saying, we prefer not to get involved. Go ahead with your legal business. We're not going to get involved. Find a different bank. And that's actually what has restricted quite a lot of legal, legitimate commerce for humanitarian trade in the last several years. Let me, let me uh, refine the question one more step and take it from, in effect, this technical ground to the strategic political ground. Right. Um, does that mean that uh, a year from now, after implementation day, the Treasury Department, finance ministries, others will still have a lot of leverage over Iran because of remaining sanctions and all of the discretion they have in uh, enforcement? So this depends a little bit on how fast you think uh, companies and banks will get comfortable with the risk and go in. Uh, I think while we, there's a lot of risk there that will make everyone who is interested and sees commercial benefit in going in move slowly, the, um, the prize is great. You know, Iran is a, a, a very attractive emerging market for investment. It's a large population, 80 million people, uh, well-educated. There's a relatively well-developed financial system. Um, there is, once these banks get into, you know, relinked back into the international financial system, there's connectivity there. So I think over time, uh, as Iran becomes more and more linked into the international financial system, uh, you'll see more commerce. And if uh, the EU and the U.S. Uh, see their companies go in, so right now that's very narrow for the U.S., then the EU and the U.S. will have a lot of economic leverage. But if Iran's economic opening proceeds in a way that does not involve a lot of EU and U.S. companies, 
then the U.S. and the EU will not have so much leverage to directly go after Iran and try and isolate it economically in the future. So that's a big deal. And for everyone out there who is thinking about um, skeptics in Washington and elsewhere, who's thinking about um, this deal and the future of, uh, of policy with Iran, if they're contemplating the contingency planning that might give them a backup plan later, there are several things built into this agreement, including a snapback of sanctions, but they might also be thinking about how to create the economic conditions so that eventually, if necessary, if political diplomatic circumstances merit, nuclear circumstances merit, there is leverage. But that will take more intentionality that I think U.S. policymakers have right now about building that contingency plan. We'll come back to you later about snapback, I promise, because I know people want to hear how that may work or may not work. But Robin, you've been in Iran, I think, three times in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, the Obama administration has been very careful to say that this agreement is about nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. It's not based on the premise that it will cause Iran to change in fundamental ways. But I want to ask you to go ahead and jump into that question anyway. What do you think are the prospects of, uh, of real change in Iran in, in either direction? It, a, if this, if this uh, agreement works out, and B, if it doesn't. Uh, thank you, Doyle. I'm honored to be on uh, a panel with such distinguished experts. Um, I, I want to address that question in, uh, in three different ways. First of all, what does Iran get out of the deal? Why did it uh, engage to begin with? And kind of what could go wrong? And it's fascinating to look at uh, what Iran gets out of it. it. Everybody went into this as a transactional negotiation. This was over a nuclear program. but. In the back of everyone's mind was always the issue of, is this the potential to be a transformative moment? After 36 years of tension, where Iran has risen to be one of the, whether it's the most feared states, um, uh, destabilizing influences, uh, supporters of terrorism, uh, with a, a, a potentially nascent uh, nuclear program. So uh, Iran, from the beginning, wanted uh, far more than just sanctions relief. Uh, it wanted, first and foremost, recognition of the Islamic Republic. Uh, it, in its early arrogance, talked about neither East nor West. And it learned in very difficult ways over 36 years um, that it needed both East and West, uh, particularly in the 21st century in an era of globalization. And part of the process of engaging with the five uh, veto-wielding powers of, at the United Nations plus Germany um, was to get that recognition for its revolution, to re-enter the international uh, arena. It has tried repeatedly over the years, uh, whether it was during President Rafsanjani and his overture to the West, uh, the United States specifically, with a commercial deal uh, offering Conoco the most lucrative contract ever uh, to develop oil and gas, uh, whether it was the Iran-Contra affair in the 80s, arms for hostages, um, whether it was President Khatami's bring down the wall of mistrust. They have tried in different ways to uh, get recognition for their revolution. And in many ways, the nuclear deal is a way of saying, we recognize you, and we're not after regime change anymore. It's a formal declaration that you are the official interlocutor when it comes to any uh, major diplomatic or international issue. And that, in many ways, was what Iran gets out of this first and foremost. Um, it also takes, I mean, it obviously, it, it opens up the uh, economic avenues. Uh, President Rouhani, when he came to power, acknowledged on national television that their coffers were empty. This is largely because of uh, mismanagement, secondly sanctions, but it was their own mismanagement during uh, the era of President Ahmadinejad that led to gross corruption and uh, waste of funds. Uh, Iran needs, according to the State Department, about a trillion dollars of investment to bring its infrastructure back up. It's really deteriorated. They made some investments, but they haven't done it always very well. 
when I went to see the deputy oil minister in Iran, he talked about uh, plans for $200 billion worth of uh, investment for the oil and gas industry that they have already designed. Their hope is to, uh, within a year after uh, investment, which is a good ways down the road, as Liz points out, uh, produce another 700,000 to a million uh, barrels a day of oil, which will have their own, its own repercussions. Uh, it has no illusions about how fast this is going to happen. There's already a good deal of preparation of the Iranian public that this is, the sanctions relief is not going to be instant, that it's going to be uh, phased, uh, that it will take time to build confidence. But the Iranians are very aggressively going out and inviting uh, foreign companies, anybody who's interested to come and visit. Uh, when I went to Iran in May, it was difficult to get a hotel room. And everybody's, uh, you, you, there's a whole different clientele there today than there was um, a year ago. Uh, Iran also is, is in this because of, um, of the threat. It feels for the first time um, uh, since the end of the Iran-Iraq war incredibly vulnerable. ISIS has gotten to within 25 miles of its border. And this is something that is an existential threat. Uh, it's deeply concerned about the repercussions of the ISIS, the emergence of ISIS, whether it is the crumbling of the Middle East map. Iran is one of those countries, like the United States, that actually wants to see the Sykes-Picot map uh, stay as it was. They don't want to see 100 little mini-states, as someone uh, said to me, that's against their interests. They're also profoundly concerned that the rise of ISIS, just like Al-Qaeda earlier and the Taliban earlier, deepens the sectarian divide. And remember, even though Iran is a powerful Shiite country, the largest Shiite country in the world, it is still a distinct minority in the region, whether it's uh, the uh, Arab world to the, to the west, uh, South Asia to the east, even uh, Central Asia to the north. And so it feels, ironically, though we see it from the prism of it as a threat, it feels, it feels vulnerable. Um, the term Shiite Crescent was actually coined in an interview I did with uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, um, after which his office called and said, please, please don't use that term. And uh, obviously it was on the record, so I did. Uh, and it took, a, it took a life of its own. What's interesting when you talk to the Iranians is how they feel that they are encircled. Uh, there's a Sunni circle surrounding them that is um, uh, increasingly uh, a threat to, to his, its interests. So um, let me get secondly to the context of why it, it engaged in um, negotiations. Well, I've actually covered some of that, so I'll, I'll go to the third point. And that's what may not go well? What are the, the prospects um, uh, for change? I think Iran uh, very much wants to re-engage with the world. And that, that that was part of the fundamental decision that went into uh, going to the negotiating table. Uh, because of the threats, uh, because it understands its own political dynamics. Uh, Iran, its revolutionaries are now in their late 50s, 60s, and 70s. The Supreme Leader turned 76 this month. Uh, there is a sense that in the next decade, next 15 years, interestingly coinciding with the nuclear deal, that there is the um, potential for profound change inside Iran um, with the, the, if you go by actuarial ch uh, uh, charts, the Supreme Leader who's suffered from prostate problems already um, is likely to pass from the scene and Iran will have to elect a new leader who will define the limits or the freedoms of the next era. Um, the majority of Iranians are now under the age of 35, but much more fundamentally, more than half of the electorate is now under 35. In other words, born since the revolution. And they have enormous influence. And the debate among that generation is no longer about the ideal Islamic state. It is increasingly about uh, how do you use 21st century technology? to change society, to advance society. One of the most interesting things for me during my trip was going around and talking to the young startups. Uh, the largest e-commerce company in the Middle East today is Iran's equivalent of Amazon. Uh, the, the kids have come up with an extraordinary array, whether it's the Groupon of Iran, uh, the Indiegogo, which raises uh, funds for cultural projects, uh, uh, the YouTube of Iran that uh, they're very 
engaged in creating a whole new space. Even though there is censorship of millions of websites, even though there is a committee that actually c patrols and can, uh, you know, is a cyberspace uh, check and balance on, it, on Iranians, and they can be hauled in for, uh, for charges, uh, you know, for, for things they say on the internet. Uh, there is still an, uh, uh, enough new avenues. Uh, there's a use of VPN, virtual private networks, to, to sign on to the international um, internet, and they are very engaged. Uh, uh, Iran is, uh, the, the debate over the future of Iran, uh, as I wrote in The New Yorker, is in many ways plays out over the future of WhatsApp, Vi Viper, and Tango. And the, these means of sharing, whether it's the naughty political humor or um, um, messages, uh, poli uh, political commentary, that uh, the Iranians are trying to rein these in uh, by creating the government, their, their own uh, alternatives, but th uh, the young are looking elsewhere. So anyway, um, I think that the, the, the government understands this is a moment uh, to engage because of its own security conflicts, um, its own concerns about what's happening in the region, but also because of what's happening within Iranian society. The supreme leader has to listen to the noise. Uh, that's always been a role. Even if the hardliners control the, the different agencies of government, it is, uh, you can't get around one of the most dynamic and outspoken populations in the region. Um, what, you know, what could go wrong? Um, look, this is a, a deal that everyone thinks is kind of, because they've agreed to it, that it's likely to happen. There's quite a long time frame. Uh, the president or the Congress is likely to vote by the September 17th or 18th. The calculation is that the drama will play out between Congress and the White House uh, by October 1st. And then Iran goes through its debate in the Majlis over whether to approve the deal. It has said it's going to take 80 days instead of 60 days, and that it's not even going to begin to vote until after the United States has voted. So then we're into mid-October. Then, only then, do we begin the process of implementation, which the Iranians calculate could take four to six months. I defer to my nuclear uh, colleagues on, on that issue. Um, the U.S. thinks it may take six to eight months. So we're talking well into next year uh, before it even begins to play out. And the rule of thumb in the Middle East is that events on the ground always overtake diplomacy. How many uh, accords or peace, you know, road maps and so forth have we had that everyone thinks, oh, we've, we've got a solution or a way forward, and that implodes because of it's uh, diverted, it's undermined, there are spoilers or whatever. And there are a lot of spoilers, both in the region and inside Iran. And uh, I think the hardliners are very concerned uh, less about the nuclear deal than the fact that in February, Iran faces its own election for both parliament and the assembly of experts. And this, in many ways, is uh, a moment where the political pendulum could swing. Uh, parliament has been in a, uh, been a lock by hardliners for the last decade. And uh, when I went to see one of the hardline uh, coalitions, a coalition of nine hardline parties in Iran, uh, its chairman said that if there's a deal, that that will garner an additional 25% for the supporters of President Rouhani, and that would change the balance of power inside parliament. Even more importantly, uh, the same election will also select the 86 members of the Assembly of Experts. And the Assembly of Experts control, uh, and in theory can oust, but they control uh, who is the supreme leader. And because they sit for, this body sits for eight years, it's widely assumed that whoever is elected will select the supreme leader. And a little bit like the College of Cardinals, um, this, the, uh, what the next supreme leader will come from within the, these 86 people. And the hardliners in many ways are less concerned about the nuclear deal than they are about how this deal could impact domestic politics and, and lose their hold on power. And so there are a number who, within the system, could try to undermine, not because they are opposed to you know, sanctions relief or a deal, but because their own political future is at stake. And that then, in turn, of course, reflects on Doyle's initial question, and this is where I'll wrap up, uh, the prospects for change. They're also afraid, in many ways, that President Rouhani is the President Gorbachev. Uh, of Iran, that he, by opening up to the outside world and trying to reform within, 
the equivalent of perestroika and glasnost, will then lead to the undermining of the Iranian revolution. And as I said, at the end of the day, the whole deal for Iran was far less about the nuclear deal than it was the future and fate of the revolution itself. Robin, let me, uh, we will get to questions in a moment from the audience, but let me just follow up on one piece of that uh, short-term internal dynamic. There is a school of thought, I've heard some American officials say, that if this uh, agreement is, uh, uh, is approved by both parliaments, then we should expect, in terms of Iran's behavior in the Middle East, uh, not an immediate moderation, but actually more probably an immediate intensification, because the hardliners in, s in those organizations, the Revolutionary Guards and others, will say, okay, Rouhani, you got your nuclear deal, what about us? Is that a, uh, a, a reasonable scenario? Well, it's a very good question, and it, it will go to a lot of the rhetoric we see out of Tehran. And one of the things that the deputy oil minister said to me, I said, you know, what will happen afterwards? He said, oh, both sides will start shouting at each other. We'll say all the things that, that will be uh, destructive to our, uh, to our mutual interests, he said, and then we'll all get back to business. Everybody kind of wanna get, wants to get back to that state of, of normalcy. But I think there will be a payoff. And of course, a lot of us have questions about what happens with that $100 billion. Uh, I think that the Iranian government really has en faces enormous pressure in uh, rebuilding the infrastructure. It has atrophied more than that in uh, 36 years of, of sanctions, particularly over the past um, uh, 10 years. Uh, the question is, will the Revolutionary Guards get their payoff in the form of more aid for nefarious activities? Or will they get the payoff for all the companies that they have spun off that are engaged in construction and that they will get some of the windfall of funds for the rebuilding, which is the way the system has been corrupted, uh, whether it's the new international airport in Tehran, the metro, that all of these projects are done by Revolutionary Guard construction companies. And that the payoff, we assume, you know, and for understandable reasons, may automatically go for uh, Quds Force, the Delta Force of, or the S S Navy SEALs of Iran may go f to help Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Shiite uh, militias. That there actually may be another way to pay off the Revolutionary Guards. Um, uh, look, el everybody who knows Iran worries about whether, how it will use that money. The truth is that, uh, that throughout the past 36 years, the hardliners have Manage, the hardline wings of the revolution have always managed to get whatever funds they needed. Hezbollah has never been hurting for money or missiles. Um, the uh, same is true um, of Hamas. The big, biggest problem is how do you actually get them there? Uh, Iran has been quite daring trying to, to get it aid. Uh, that those insurgency operations are actually not huge ticket items. Um, and they can absorb them in, in their current budget. Um, uh, it's interesting, when I put this question to a very senior U.S. official, he said that the U.S. has been monitoring very closely what happened with uh, about $14 billion they've gotten already through the interim agreement. And they believe, and I don't know how they tell, but they believe that none of the f not, not, nothing of the $14 billion has gone to, um, you know, the, the bad boys. Uh, does that guarantee none of it in the future? No. Uh, and that will be one of the, the really most sensitive issues, I think. As I say, we'll get to audience questions in a moment, but I have one question that I want to pose to everyone here in a, in a quick lightning round, and, and it's this. Uh, one of the administration's key arguments has been, well, if you don't like this deal, what is your alternative? If Congress says no, and if Congress overrides a veto, what are you going to put in its, in its place? The opponents of the deal have, have proposed uh, and, uh, at least two interesting alternatives. Well, first, and the administration also says, and at that point, the sanctions regime collapses, and so you have no, no more leverage. So A, is that true? Some of the opponents have said, okay, there are two things that could happen if Congress says no. One is that the president could go try and renegotiate. There's actually a more sophisticated version of that argument, which is, if this president says, no, I won't rene renegotiate, I've negotiated a perfectly sensible deal, the president can actually go ahead through executive action, implement large parts of the deal, um, and then 
at that point, the United States has, oddly enough, the deal goes forward, but the United States has retained more leverage for the next president, whoever she or he may be, to then pick up the account. So my question for each of you to answer in 90 seconds or less is, what happens if Congress says no? Is there an alternative? Make no mistake about it. Uh, this is a war and peace issue. There's not a doubt in my mind that if Congress kills this deal, uh, we will be on a path to war. The inspection regime will collapse. The constraints on Iran's nuclear program will disappear. Iran will start installing centrifuges and enriching uranium. They will get very close <laughs> to a nuclear bomb capability uh, in a matter of months, and that will escalate the pressures on the United States or Israel to take a military strike. And if we take a military strike, it's not an overnight raid. It's not the fantasy that Senator Cotton proposes of two or three days of bombings. This is a multi-week, thousands of sortie campaign that will kill thousands of Iranians and will ignite the biggest war we've ever seen in the Middle East. It'll make Iraq and Afghanistan look like warm-up acts. And if you are deterred from that war option, then you're going to sit back and you're going to watch Iran move towards a, b a bomb unfettered. So your alternatives are uh, Iran with a bomb or war or both. You go to war and Iran gets the bomb even quicker. The idea that you can go back and negotiate a better deal is a unicorn option. It is an attractive fantasy. It doesn't exist. There is no scenario under which we can ima imagine our allies or the Iranians going back to the table on a deal that everyone else has agreed to. In the rest of the world, with the exception of Israel, this agreement is completely non-controversial. It is a no-brainer. It is a win-win scenario. It's only here in Washington, in large part because of Bibi Netanyahu's opposition, that we see the controversy around this deal. Ollie, I'm going to ask it of, of you really, a, a, this is more a legal question than a technical question, I suppose, but, but look, the UN Security Council has already approved this deal. If Congress says no, the deal is still there, the IAEA is still working, it's the United States that is out of compliance and not Iran. Is it possible to imagine a scenario in which Iran and IAEA and the EU and others implement the deal with the United States not fully complying? I don't think it's a realistic thing because the U.S. has many other things, the SWIFT and other. But, you know, I don't think it's that simplified that it's a deal or a war. I think it's too simplified analysis. And why I say that? First of all, I think that the Iranians, when they, if this deal doesn't go through here in the U.S. system, they will take, they are clever people, they will take uh, very careful measures, what to do, how to escalate, where to go. So there are also options in between. They are not going to dash with this infrastructure in, you know, uh, three months time and manufacture a nuclear weapon. It's not in their interest. Their military is not even capable to defend. So uh, let's put this one aside and calm down and cool down and look what else can be done. And I think that the first thing is to talk with the Iranians that, you know, look, you know, we ended up in this unfortunate situation. So would it be better that we look together the way out? Because it's also in their interest. And there are a few aspects in this uh, agreement which I think that can be improved and provide those as additional assurances which, uh, uh, you know, people would like to have. And, uh, you know, I don't think that this is a huge negotiation and such. There are four or five items which, if they are fixed, this will be better deal. Certainly it will never be a perfect, but there is no perfect thing in the world. So, you know, I think that people should uh, make a much more calm analysis and keep cool and look then where to go. And there are a few things which need to be done anyway. Uh, this is a political deal. This is not a non-proliferation deal for me. So this will have then proliferation uh, consequences. One big con consequence is here that we make a deal with a country which is in non-compliance with its uh, non-proliferation undertaking. There is no lawyer who says that it's not true. So we create a pre precedent for the future. 
So this is good to keep in mind. The second thing is that it has also impacts on the region. Even if Saudi say something nice today, look that in last uh, six months they have concluded uh, six uh, nuclear cooperation agreements. They are positioning themselves to year 10. That's what I think they are doing. So we can mitigate some of those consequences by some additional arrangements. These are just a few remarks I have, certainly more if needed. Uh, Liz, if, if Congress says no, does the sanctions regime collapse? Does it collapse quickly or slowly? Does it collapse entirely or partially? Right. Um, I, th I think it's important to keep a couple of things in mind here. The first is you can hate the deal and wish that this weren't the deal. But you cannot deny that multilateralism in sanctions is what had the overwhelming economic effect on Iran, which means the United States cannot go it alone. You saw decades of the U.S. trying to go it alone, and that did not produce the economic effect that occurred starting about 2012 when uh, leading up to this with U.N. Security Council resolutions with sanctions, and then uh, in 2012 when the U.S. and the EU together, two very significant, sizable, financial uh, jurisdictions imposed together coordinated economic sanctions on Iran. So can the president go it alone if Congress ties his hand? The answer is <coughs> there are a number of things that, he, that the president can do independently, but a lot of the economic sanctions, the, the meaningful economic sanctions um, that Iran seeks relief from, Congress has a lot of control over. So no, the president cannot give Iran all of the uh, economic relief promised in this agreement, which very well may mean that Iran walks from the deal, so everyone should know that. Um, additionally, will the sanctions really regime collapse? If you have a failure of international participation in the sanctions, uh, in the sanctions regime, I, I don't think you'll see a total utter collapse, and there's a variety of other jurisdictions that uh, support and agree with terrorism sanctions, regional destabilization ones, they have them on their own books, they're not planning on taking them away, they will cooperate on those. But on the nuclear ones, um, I think you're looking at a crumbling. And if we think, for example, about the Cuba, Cuba case, <coughs> that's a case of unilateral sanctions that pretty much everyone in the world, including lots of people in the U.S. government, agree have failed because of their unilateral nature. There's tons of opportunity for evasion. Is that the kind of <laughs> is that the kind of policy future we want to set up with Iran? Also, we should bear in mind, and I'll stop with this, the ramifications for the use of sanctions as a coercive economic tool, which is one of the most significant tools in the U.S. foreign policy toolkit, there's a lot at stake here besides just what happens with Iran. And if this fails in Iran, if, if sanctions wind up looking weak, if the U.S. winds up looking like it can't go it alone <coughs> when, when, even when it's trying to, then it takes this tool off the table. It makes it look weak and um, poorly constructed and as though U.S. policymakers are not wise and not careful and not competent in wielding it in the future. Think about all the potential future security considerations, uh, security threats that the United States might want to use sanctions for. Well, we can degrade the opportunity to use sanctions in the future. Uh, Robin, as, as Liz reminds us, Iran has a vote here, too. So in 90 yeah. seconds or less, if Congress uh, blocks the uh, United States from implementing the deal, what do the Iranians do? Well, it will be very interesting because then the, uh, it will go to the Majlis, Iran's parliament. And uh, it will be interesting to see if, because the hardliners prevail, they decide to uh, do exactly as Congress did and reject the deal, or whether uh, mm. the regime will decide, well, we're going to show them that we were willing all along and we're going to approve it and make the United States responsible, and then that undermines the prospect of, um, of keeping any kind of sanctions regime. But I think the political consequences are the thing th that we should be most sensitive to, and that is that Khamenei, the supreme leader, will feel that he was right, you can't deal with the United States. This will make any kind of re-engagement uh, all the more difficult, if not impossible, that it will influence the outcome of the parliamentary and assembly of expert elections next February. It will look, I think it will uh, um, emasculate politically President Rouhani and possibly force uh, uh, the foreign minister Zarif to resign or um, get a vote of no confidence in parliament. That the political consequences of this falling apart in terms of what we want. Remember, the whole thing has been about really getting a change in Iran's behavior. 
And the question always was, do you go to war or do you use diplomacy to try to get them to change their behavior on the nuclear question, but basically across the board on everything else. And so that if we say no on this, that it has then uh, a sweeping repercussion on the broader issue of changing Iran's behavior, because they will decide uh, that it will be um, not in their interest to engage. At the same time, when I asked Sarif that question in May, uh, we had a long, I saw him five hours in April and a couple of hours in May, and I said, what will happen? He said, well, we won't necessarily go back to where we were in terms of escalating things. And I think there will be a period where the Iranians won't race back to centrifuge production, but uh, it certainly will give the hardliners the argument that there's the only way to protect, protect ourselves now from a war is to have a nuclear capability. Uh, we have an erudite and very patient audience, and uh, we have a microphone, two microphones, so uh, I will start calling on people. Please make your questions as brief and pointed as possible. Sir. Uh, Peter Humphrey, uh, intelligence analyst and former diplomat. The UNSCON regime was infinitely stronger than what I'm seeing uh, in this current inspection. Uh, and the head of the ir Iraqi nuclear program was Shia. We have no idea what Iran may have learned, what Iranian intelligence may have learned about the Iraqi program, and we have little idea about what they learned from AQ Khan. How can you say you've got an inspection regime without exhaustive interviews of a couple hundred scientists and engineers? And why can't Congress go back to uh, President Obama and say, we're going to sign off on this if you give us those scientist interviews and do away with that stupid 24-hour delay? Uh, 24 days. Ali, uh, this I think is, is partly a PMD question, to use a term of art. Yeah, I actually. Past uh, military activities. Yeah, good. First of all, I did not address the PMD uh, at all because of the time pressure. You know, first of all, I answer to this, but I use this opportunity also to say a couple of words. You, you have seen that there's a roadmap uh, agreement between the IAEA and Iran and it will be executed in the next few months. This will not put, in my view, the question of military dimension to rest for a number of reasons. The first reason is that uh, when you look at the reference there, actually Iran is supposed to answer to the questions which IAEA raised in November 2011. These are not the old questions which the IAEA has. Amano has, Mr. Amano has repeatedly said that there is some new information which came after that, and he wants to address those. That's one thing. And you as an intelligence analyst also know that when you write a report like IAA did in uh, November 2011, you put there only things which you are sure are worth of uh, asking, and they have passed your veracity test. So there will be probably additional set of questions which will be asked. And then I look at the time scale at the same time. So time scale is that the IAEA now writes the questions next month, gets an answer by mid-September. Uh, then they will have this conclusive meeting and with the answers in mid-October. And then IAEA submits its own assessment on the responses of Iran by mid-December. In that time, you cannot make a thorough investigation and come to the conclusion, was it there or not? And I give you just a couple of examples so you understand better. There's a lot of talk about the parching and that uh, vessel there. If I were there, you know, to look at this, first of all, you want to see who, who manufactured them, talk with the guy who designed it, talk with the scientist who used it, talk with the guy who brought the equipment, talk with the company who sold the equipment. You want to make sure that there's no other such piece of equipment uh, made. You take samples, you take samples from the equipment, you take samples from parts in, uh, all this. You cannot do that job in two months. It's impossible. And I give you an example with the Libyan uh, nuclear program. They signed the, or they admitted this in uh, December 2003. Two years later, 2006, they uh, signed, uh, ratified the additional protocol, and the IAEA came to the conclusion also from the weapons part in summer 2008 that there are no concerns. It took uh, more than uh, four, four years, actually, wi with a country which cooperated to come to this conclusion. So we ought to keep this mind. Then, should IAEA keep the names? Yeah, 
should I uh, give the names and the companies at this point of time to public or to Congress? I think that from the investigative point of view, no, because uh, whoever is in the receiving end can uh, fix the story to match with those information. So these are a little bit counterproductive, some of those uh, requests which I see out there. A question in the front row. Thanks to the panel for excellent presentations. I'm Rob Litvak from the Wilson Center. Question for Ali Hanan. Ali, your views, your expert opinions have been cited by Michael Gordon in the New York Times and juxtaposed with Secretary Moniz. And I don't think going back to the negotiating table is an option this deal was a deal among the P5 plus one, as well as with, with Iran. So what is your judgment? I mean, if you were asked for a bottom line recommendation, do you recommend that the Senate accept or reject this, this agreement? And then for Elizabeth, um, uh, as a non kind of economist, I was surprised that in the current round of discussions about sanctions, we haven't seen a replay of what happened in the mid 90s over secondary sanctions, because what seems to have a lot of teeth uh, from the American perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans is sort of the secondary, or seem to be secondary sanction effects in terms of European entities. And I wonder in the absence if, if there were to be a breakdown of the diplomatic process and we try to kind of resume uh, sanctions, whether at that point, in addition to what Robin cited, namely that the Iranians would try to make the United States the issue at that point, not Iran, would we start to see Iranian pushback on the application of these secondary sanctions against European uh, entities that would want to do business in Iran? So, Ole, yay or nay? Uh, none of those. <laughs> no. I look at it in a very but different... that's the choice. No, yes it's, it's no. still... Can I... Insta yeah, but that's the choice. He may have asked a question. Yes or no? I answer the way... I, there is a freedom for the individuals <laughs> how they answer. You don't need to put words draw to my mouth. Uh, I, I approach this from the risk management point of view and risk assessment point of view. And this is a political decision. And my job as a technical guy is to tell which are the strengths and which are the weaknesses of the, this agreement. And uh, it's for the political people to decide whether they can take the risk, because there are many other elements here, you know, sanctions, uh, you know, snapbacks, and all those other elements which I have nothing to do personally. So when I was asked this same question in Congress yesterday, I said, should I uh, rate this from scale 1 to 10, you know, the strengths and uh, weaknesses is, I said that, you know, for the declared facilities, the verification see scheme which is there, I, I would give it, you know, rate 7, 8. So it's a good system, but it's not perfect. No verification system is ever perfect. But then we come to this part which are we where we have the weaknesses, like uh, access to suspected sites to confirm the absence of undeclared activities and taking the history and at the same time to see that uh, many cap capacities stay there and with the limited access. So there I gave there number five. So that if I see that, you know, it could be much better, but this is what we have. And then I said that there are certain parts, which I said actually in my introductory remarks, that there are certain things which you can't verify at all in this agreement, like this weaponization uh, related uh, activities, uh, design of implosion devices. You get it if you get lucky with some, uh, you know, intelligence, but there's no technical mean that you can find a computer software which is running in someone's office. This is my answer to that, and I, I sorry, Joe, but I stick to that. Uh, Liz. Push back. Uh, will we hear from Iran? Absolutely. I, they're probably already crafting the, the talking points that say, uh, you haven't done enough, the P5 plus one hasn't done, done enough to uphold your part of the deal, Wh you know, where's, where are the goods? Um, uh, from European companies, um, uh, I was reminded recently that the European laws preventing EU companies from complying with US sanctions are still on the books. Uh, but if we get into a point where um, we see EU financial regulators or others try and enforce this, uh, we have much greater diplomatic <laughs> problems between uh, in the transatlantic community. But uh, there's definitely an opportunity for uh, tension there. However, because the compliance environment right now, the compliance culture in the um, uh, multinational financial services company, that is to say international banks, is such that they are, they're so cautious about US financial regulator penalties um, that have come down very hard on EU banks uh, 
uh, BNP Paribas, $12 billion fine, HSBC, Commerce Bank, um, Deutsche Bank, ABN AMRO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, they're, these banks are so cautious that they will be very, very careful and they will be some of the last to push back publicly. But um, I do think that smaller regional banks, including in Asia and the Middle East, um, will, will really try and play a game of chicken. Liz, I, I, I promised to ask about snapback, which is the provision in the agreement under which if anyone, but particularly Iran, is out of compliance, any single member uh, of the UN Security, of any of the P5 on the Security Council can, in effect, to shorthand it, uh, force reimposition of sanctions. Uh, Proponents have said this is a brilliant solution that is foolproof, and opponents have said it's delusional, it'll never work. Which camp are you in? If we're talking about a significant material breach in the nuclear program, I believe it will work. Not very fast, but it will work. What is concerning is, uh, is um, what happens if there's a slow creep, um, and will the uh, those uh, jurisdictions that have powerful sanctions, uh, that potentially have powerful sanctions against Iran, the U.S., the EU, the U.N., um, be willing to go out alone to push the process, to accelerate the process, to contemplate a creative solution, a partial snapback, et cetera? That's the question, and I think it's, it's very difficult. That will be very difficult. And though there's goodwill from P5 plus one members of the U.S. to, to go there, to, to contemplate acting on smaller measures, um, I'm worried about that. Uh, Milton Honig, International Center for Terrorism Studies. Uh, I'm wondering if during the negotiations, the United States brought up the idea of Iran multinationalizing its enrichment enterprise at some time in the future, say in 10 years. Uh, I go back to the 2003 time frame when uh, Iran had a fledgling centrifuge program and did bring up the idea of bringing in foreign countries into uh, the activities. What do you think of the possibility of multinationalization? And Joe, why don't you take that one? Uh, I think that is one of the solutions that people have been proposing for Iran for several years. Iran has actually indicated it would be interested if the uranium enrichment facility was in Iran, uh, multinational but located in Iran. We've resisted that idea for, for uh, obvious reasons. But this is the kind of thing we would now have to explore. No one agreement solves a problem. No treaty ends the underlying conflicts. This is, should be considered just a brick in the building we have to build in the, in the Middle East. A lot of what happens 10 years from now, 15 years from now, depends on what we do during those 10 or 15 years. Do we come up with other barriers? Do we come up with other solutions that make it increasingly unlikely that Iran or anyone else in the Middle East can build a nuclear weapon? I'm a big fan of the uh, multinational enrichment facility. This is the solution Europe came up with to make sure that Germany didn't get uh, access to uranium enrichment technology. Germany participates in such a multilateral arrangement. These are the kinds of ideas we now have to be proposing over the next 10 or 15 years. We have time for one or two more questions, sir. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tua. Uh, my question has two parts. Uh, Robin Wright talked about how Iran feels vulnerable and encircled. Uh, observers inside and outside the region argue that it is actually Iran that is encircling its neighbors. So my first question is, does this deal provide some kind of basis for uh, accommodations between the two sides and uh, a possible detente, uh, Sunni Shia detente? And secondly, would uh, not such a detente provide a lot of increased pressure on Israel to fundamentally adjust its approach to its conflict with the Palestinians? Robin. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, look, 
I take it that was your answer to the last <laughs> part of the question. <laughs> um, we've had a split between Sunni and Shia for 14 centuries. It's not going to disappear uh, anytime soon. But I do think that there is a genuine interest both in Washington and Tehran to try to use a nuclear deal if they can get approval for it uh, to channel into other issues. I think particularly Syria. I think that this is one that I know has been brought up. I think there has been discussion as well about Syria, about Yemen. Um, and obviously we're coordinating, uh, not coordinating, we're, we're, we have a common enemy in Iraq, uh, in ISIS. Um, more importantly, I think what's interesting about the P5 plus one framework is the fact that you got six major powers for two years to be united in their approach to stick together when they were at increasing odds over other issues, be it the Ukraine or the South China Seas, and that there's already talk of how you can channel or use that model for other issues, notably on Syria, potentially on not just Middle East issues, but looking at it as something, this is what the UN was really built to do in the first place, and can you use that uh, as a global model for conflict? And that's what's really important about holding this, this uh, framework uh, deal together. Um, I think that, that it would, that there would, th th both the Iranians have made, and the United States have made clear that they're interested in engaging. Uh, the Supreme Leader in a speech on April 9th had a very interesting line that everybody in Tehran wanted to talk about while I was there. It was full of the normal bombast. You know, the Americans are trustworthy and a lot of other um, uh, disparaging comments. But in the speech he said, uh, if we can mm -hmm. agree with each other or come to terms on the nuclear agreement, maybe we can, we can talk to each other about other issues. And that was s s seen as a test. And even the hardliners I went to see, the chairman of Parliament's Foreign Policy and National Security Committee, uh, the Foreign Policy Advisor to the Speaker of Parliament, who's a real hardliner, used to be the ambassador to Syria, all of them talked about the, the nu nuclear deal being a test case for whether there was the potential for discussion. Uh, no grand, you know, peace formula that Tehran and Washington are going to do together, but something that they could, in an international forum, agree to try to, to tackle, possibly within the P plus, P 5 plus 1 framework. Uh, and and uh, in the week, final week of diplomacy, uh, Zarif, the foreign minister, issued a YouTube video in English, it was about five minutes, that talked about the potential of channeling this deal into other flashpoints. Um, and he's used that language since the deal in explaining the benefits for Iranians back home. So, um, and the Americans have already talked I I about trying to bring Iran and the Gulf states particularly together to talk about common security concerns in the aftermath. Um, I've had a number of briefings from the administration and there is an intent obviously to try to use this. The problem is we've got to get past this, this period of can we even get, can we even get approval for it? And so I think there is enormous potential. Um, nothing formal, nothing, you know, Tehran and Washington marching down the road together hand in hand, no way. Uh, and there'll be a lot of noise. There'll be interpretation of the deal in different ways. Uh, the, the fundamental differences in terms of political values, alliances, will linger for decades to come. But the fact is, you know, to solve a lot of these problems, Iran has to be a player. Uh, in the same way the Iranians understand that the United States has to be the dominant, you know, the dominant speaker. And I think that's what the, the nuclear deal is most important for. Yeah. Robin, thank you for allowing us to close on a note that is at the same time positive and soberly realistic. I'm afraid we have run out of time, so please join me in thanking the Wilson Center and this extraordinary panel for their time. <laughs>